Hello everyone and welcome to this additional video for the workshop on folding sevens. This is supposed to guide you through how to fold a heptagon following Tom Holtz construction and then I will show you a way that you can circumvent those instructions and even make it a lot simpler for you. But uh, let's just get started, shall we? Alright. So, we're here with my rectangular piece of paper. I'm going to move <coughs> the microphone around a little bit and first off I'm going to actually cut a square away from this. So folding the short edge onto the long edge will give me a bisection of a right angle only because this piece of paper is also folded up as a... Now what can I tell you? That's a right angle, right? We have the advantage of civilization on our side and the fact is that we find the convenience very useful of having four right angles. So I cut away my Time to use this paper here, and I'm going to take out the instructions and I'll put them on the on the desk here so you guys can see with me. Have them up on the wall because I think that, that that's how important they are. So we're going to look at this step first, right? So first step is fold your square in half like this, right? So we have a square here, and we start by folding it in half one way, and then we fold it in half. The other way. You can find this, these instructions in the link on the description of this video. It will link you to a paper by Tom Hall, which is fairly available on the internet. And you can also find it in his book. Um, I think it's, yeah, the, the latest Tom Hall book. So, anyway, then to fold this in half of the half, so it'll give us a quarter, and also here to get another quarter. I apologize for the shadows and just general lighting problems. You know how it is. It's just the whiteness and the light and all this. So, so far, so good. We have this thing now. Now, it says that we should fold these in mountains. That's what those arrows there indicate, that they must be folded up in mountains. So, we are going to change the state of this fold to keep with the rest of the orientations. And now we have this. Right, And so what it's saying is that we now have to divide step two. It says we bring that B point, which is the bottom, to A point, which is at the top here. Pretty much it says fold this in half. And actually sort of mark it. So that now has a name, that point there at the, at the edge. I'm actually going to write it down with a permanent marker. Because I think it's more noticeable on the screen there, but maybe not. So that's going to be what we're going to call P2. I'm going to regret writing these with a permanent marker. And that point over there is going to be P1. And then, oh shit, this is definitely going to be bad with a marker. Yeah, with a, with a pencil is better. So now it's going to be L1. And this is going to be L2. We're now at step three, right? So the idea is L1, L2. The idea is bring P2 onto L2 and bring P1 onto L1 at the same time with one fold, all right? I'm gonna turn it over only for my convenience. Have that point there, this point there, and they are going to fall on their respective lines. That point hits here, that point hits there, and uh, boot right on. So I'm really just minding these two. You can see that some, like, on, it might happen that these become a little unfaced on the back there. Uh, but they, you should be fine, you should be fine. As long as you can retain your, what's the word? Cordura in Spanish. Cordura, that's the word. It's like you're, you're, you're um, you gotta keep cool. <laughs> So anyway, where P1 intersects on L1, so at that point right there, we are going to apply the third axiom. I'm sure you guys are familiar now with the axioms and I'm sure you got them memorized. But the idea is that at that point we now fold a perpendicular line. So I, I wrote in that point and this is my way of doing it. This is not in the instructions. 
But this is how I prefer to do it. So I know my points, so I turn my paper over, and then I begin to fold this back like this. And I make sure that this line falls on itself, and when it does, also that the fold goes through the point that I selected, which just occasionally, not occasionally, but just happens to be that point of intersection of P1 and L1. Right, so at that point is where I want a perpendicular line. Right, so that was step four, and that's checked, and now Tom Hall has this thing where we very Western, who can blame him, I'm Westerner too, here you go. So one, two, three, four, and then five over here, we kind of like five, right? So we kind of, it's implied here that we have now opened the paper up, and now we have this thing. Right, at, at that point of intersection, now we have this perpendicular line. And the point of this line is now we're going to apply the fifth axiom in order to get like a circle thing going on here. So the idea is, well, now this line that hits there, that actually has a name now, it's point C, it has a name. So point C there is going to fall on this line, which we just got, I guess we can call it L3. Let's call it something. So I'm gonna put S for some, whatever, it doesn't really matter, right? So I'm gonna put C onto the line, but it's gonna go through O. So I have my points, I have my two points, and I have my line. So fall, C is gonna fall onto the line S for some, and it's gonna go through O for origin, I guess. So O point, C point, And there it is. And this we fold completely. And uh, this pretty much does it. So this is really, really important because now I'm going to completely go away from the instructions. So Tom Hall, I love you, man, but now we gotta go my way. So I'm calling the shots now. <laughs> you know, by magical reasoning, wow, this is crazy. Wait, no, there's no way. Now, I, I don't think that that's going through P2. Let's just be clear. It might seem like it is, but it shouldn't. It really, really shouldn't. I've done the math countless times, and it really, really, really should. That's creeping me out a little bit. It's definitely creeping me out. Like, let me look at the instructions, because there's no way. Yeah, I mean, even in the instructions, it kind of looks like it does, but it really shouldn't. Damn. Uh, makes me wonder. Anyway, from O point, I'm going to draw this line like that. And the reason why is because this line is half of a triangle of the polygon, of the heptagon that we're drawing. So that means that what I need to do is have this line be mirrored on these. So we're going to have this exchange of mountain valley, mountain valley configuration kind of deal. So if I can keep now this rhythm, this angle between this red and black, then things should be okay. So that angle right there, that separation, I need to copy it around. If I did this correctly, this angle should come about 14 times exactly. So that's the deal, that's what we're going for. So in order for this to work, I'm gonna copy this angle over on the other side. So what I can do here, and this is very unconventional, but I can fold this C line, or the line that we got in the middle, and then fold this black line. You see? And this is tricky because you need to be very careful. And being careful is not everybody's cup of tea. And what I mean by careful, I mean that you have to make sure that the, the different layers don't get away from you. All right? You need to make sure that things are laid down as much as they can be. And when you activate this fold, it needs to go through the layer in such a way that it's a mirror image of it. Not an approximation, but you, I mean, it's going to be an approximation. But we can do origami to make sure that what we got is correct. And so we were saying that this is going to be a valley and this is going to be a mountain. And so by this sequence, we can see that this one is also going to be a... That's right, you guessed it, all the way over home, I heard you. A valley. So this line needs to convert into a valley. It doesn't hurt to extend it also. It really doesn't hurt. It actually might benefit us in the long run. So I have that and this is just extended 
beautifully. So now what I can do to make sure that my fold was correct would be to activate these two at the same time. And if these two points connect with this in, the, in between, then I should be, you know, in the right track. And it is, so I, I don't see any offset on mine. It seems that this line, if I, if I lift it up into the air like that, and I slide my finger down that crease, I should feel both layers simultaneously. That's, that's the tell, that's how you know. So we have that, and now we kind of just flip it. We have this, and we flip it. This is what I call a hinge move. The idea is to use this as a sort of a reference. So we flip, we do the hinge move, and we turn it over. Now this is the side that's being cut off, right? So we apply the hinge on this side too. I've been using my deeper voice recently. How's it going? Like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> It's weird, like when we speak, the way that air comes out of our lungs, the way that we use air to talk, and which parts of the body we use when we speak, it's kind of interesting because you can actually feel the vibrations when you speak if you pay attention. Anyway, we can open this up now and actually extend some of these lines. For instance, we can extend this one, which we copy. Let me turn it over. So you can see that we have our sequence moving along nicely. It's good that we don't just willy nilly just keep going because we have to make sure that things are being properly done. And how do we make sure we can activate the folds one by one? And just make sure that the lines are sort of, you know, being respected and all this, like, you know, everything's, everything's working all right. They all seem to be the same angle being repeated, which is what we want. And so we have this now deeper compression of the thing, right? We're going deeper into the level as we keep find, folding this sort of, um, yeah, the thing, the, the fan. And so we apply the hinge maneuver once more. And this is a tell, by the way, this is not, 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 that's not a name. What I mean is, if we're doing this correctly, when we fold this, and there's no way to really, really tell, but when we fold this, and we actually, I guess I could turn it over, but this line that's right there, that's sort of the, the in-between line, it should go right between this, but there's no way to know right now if this actually will, you know, if that's actually the case. I open it up. I have my black lines there from the center. It's good to unfold also because you don't want to have too much tension saved up in your center. You want to let the paper breathe a little bit. Now, if I turn my paper over, you can see that my valley, which is the last fold I did on the sequence, is now mounting. You see? These black lines I said were valleys, but if I turn the paper over, the state is inverted. And therefore, I can activate this. The same kind of hinge maneuver deal, but now sort of like deeper into the thing. So I can turn this down, like this, and turn this one too. And then we unfold once more and see what we got. These lines. And you can see, you can somehow see that the black and the red are evenly spaced from this line of symmetry in the center. Or at least that's what we hope. And I guess this is a great time to just check. If we activate this middle fold and these two lines connect, then we did it. Yeah, we did it, you guys. Look. It might look like it's not falling because of the drawing, but it is. I, I can, I can, I can uh, see here in real life that it really is. It really, it's, uh, maybe a little bit because the center seems to be a little wonky. Maybe put a little too much pressure there. It doesn't matter. From here now, we can just extend the lines as as we've gone over the center with our divisions. We can just extend this line, and it's going to change state. So what I mean is, if we extend this line, this red line. Um, it's going to be a black on the other side. And also we can shimmy around to make sure that lines fall on themselves. For instance, this one will fall on itself. So will all the others and all these lines. They always have like their, their bodies in arms. That's not a, an origami turn, by the way.
So wait, 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 hold on. What am I doing? What am I doing? I began to just just apply the fold because I had all the folds I need now. Just by, by virtue of the extension of these lines, because you can see how a, a red becomes a black after the center, and that's the case for all odd-sided polygons. So if you have a triangle, this will happen. If you have a pentagon, this will happen. A heptagon, it will happen. A nonagon, it will happen, etc., etc., etc. So now we can actually count the amount of red and black lines. So let's see how many we have. I'm going to start counting there with the reds. I'm going to go clockwise. I don't know why I'm starting here, but let's just start there. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven black lines. And one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Uh, yeah, I, counted, I said black, but I counted red. Maybe I counted, yeah, whatever. We have seven of both. And they're evenly spaced between each other, so the spacing between each of these is constant all around the circle, all around this center. And so this pattern is what we would call a seven-fold pattern. Some people um, like to say that when we have 12 or, well, in this case, 14 lines that come out of the center like this, it's a 14-fold pattern. However, it is actually a seven-fold pattern. And we might get into what that means, but you have to trust me on this, that this actually is sevenfold, and the demonstration for it actually is this, that if we activated these red lines as mountains and the black lines as valleys, we end up with this, you see? And so the implication here is that on the black lines, for instance, there's a mirror image, and it's a mirror image because I can just fold it onto the other one and so what I do to this, I do to that. Or what I do to this, I do to the one on the other side of it, you see. So if I were to cut into this, this sequence, I would get a seven-fold pattern. I would get a pattern that would actually look seven-fold, not 14-fold. I would have to bisect this to go deeper, and then I would find the 14-fold. Now here, this is called the preliminary fold. All regular polygons have their own preliminary fold. And it's when you can just activate these lines for their symmetries. In this case, it's going to be seven of these flaps, you see. And so the challenge we face now is just finding the highest point and cutting a perpendicular line on it from a point to another, right? So we can use the, the second axiom, no, the third axiom from a point there. So let's just open it up and just make sure that I'm not talking crazy. No, I'm not talking crazy. Well, actually it works the same because either of these two points is going to work as that. So what I mean, let's just, let's just see what I mean. I'll show you. So uh, that point right there represents sort of the highest, the biggest heptagon we can make. That point right there represents the biggest heptagon we can make. So what I can do here is, well, I can actually open it up. I'm gonna draw this line. Well, I kind of want to draw it on this line that's more blank, blanker, so I can be clear about this. I want you to mind or pay close attention to which line it is I'm selecting. Notice that it's a four-sided polygon, right? It's a square, but we have two edges that share the same. I'm gonna turn it over now just to talk about this. But notice, the top and bottom edges have this open triangle like this, whereas the left and right edges have a line that hits on the midpoint. This is because seven is not a four-fold pattern. It's not, it's not four. It doesn't have four anywhere in its symmetry. It does have two in its symmetry. Well, it has one technically, so we could count this as one, but because it has this little sequence, it actually can, we can say that it has two, but not really. Not really, but it's kind of there. It's hard, that, that one is hard to explain, if I'm being honest. But anyway, what I want to do now is fold the line that goes to point C. I remind you that the point C is at the very corner there, and I want this line to fall on itself. Or it could be that line, it could be any of these two blacks. Any of them. But the point has to hit through C and any of these lines has to fall on itself. So I'm hitting point C right there and you can tell by the ink bleed right here that this is falling on itself. If you really, really want to make sure, you can always fold this and then fold it back or forward, whatever, it doesn't matter. 
and if the fold is on itself, then it will just activate very naturally. So now we have this. We have this line that goes through there. And it just so happens that this describes the edge of our heptagon. Now we could save ourselves some time, which I suggest you do, and simply fold your heptagon like this so that you see the blue line. But this blue line is going over all the layers. So in theory, you could just fold this line and so, you know, just pass it through all the layers. But just as much as a fold can just cut through, a blade and a knife can cut through too. So I'm going to take out my cutting board, my trusty cutting board here, which makes a lot of noise. Well, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Today it didn't make that much noise. My ruler, my metal ruler does make a lot of noise. So I place my, with my blade. I just saw it, wait a minute. Is this God telling me to do it without the blade? There we go. So let's save ourselves some time. So what I'm going to do now is just drag my blade down the, this blue line. Now be sure that your blade is sharp as paper is one of the more abrasive materials and it will wear down your knives pretty quickly. More than any other material. According to some comment I read online somewhere, someone, somebody was showing off this knife and they were showing it off like cutting through this huge stack of papers. And one comment was like, oh, that's a bad idea, hombre. Like, you just ruin your knife. Like, if it's sharp, it's not as sharp anymore. Not even near, my man. And I believe them. Because I'm always running through knives. Like, I'm always just going through the blades and changing my exacto knife for new blades and stuff. So there's some truth to it. Anyway. Boom. Heptagon. Ain't that some. So what you can do now is, you know, you can take out another piece of paper and put this on top of it and mark your points and then, you know, you can cut that out. That's an idea. Um, I'm going to do that just to make a cleaner heptagon. And so one of the problems you might face when having this solution already done for you is you're going to notice that it's sort of trying to get away. So you can't just find the points as easy. So what you do is you fold all the folds in both ways. So if you have a fold that's a mountain, you make it into a valley. If you have a valley, you fold it into a mountain, etc. So you just exchange the folds. So all the blacks get turned to mountains, which were valleys, and all the reds get turned to blacks, or like to valleys, which where they were mountains, right? Like it's just gonna be topsy-turvy kind of day. One, what, one, what once was is no more. Or rather it's, it's, it's ah, yeah, that's a, not a good phrase, not a good analogy, that doesn't make sense. Uh, but yeah, so that makes things a little bit flatter, a little bit. You can see some energy still being displaced on the center because of the other folds that were there. But because it's going up, I can see that, you know, it's rising. I can just turn it over and it's going to fall because it's still trying to do that curvature towards, but now it's doing it towards the surface. So I can just lay my heptagon on top of something else. And then I take out my trusty little Sharpie pen, one I regret using all the time. And I can just use my hand to hold on to this. That's one way of doing it. Or you can just use sticky tape and tape some of the edges so that it doesn't move at all, right? Maybe that's a good idea. Maybe I should do that. I'm going to cut it anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But just with two points, it should be enough for this. And I'm not gonna crease, I'm not gonna put a sticky tape on the on the vertices since that's what I'm actually caring about. So as long as I can just mark my points. Just making sure that that one's properly marked. Right, so now my seven points are on my piece of paper. I can unsticky tape this from the surface. And I can apply my axioms if I, if I so please. I have seven points. What does that mean? I can actually fold them together. That's one way of doing it and just making sure, you know, you can do that. Or simply just take out my trusty, no, 
No, I'm not. I was going to take out the knife, but no, I'm going to cut this. So I'm actually going to fold the points and then I'm going to use cuts and then that's going to be my heptagon. So if you were paying attention during this, the lesson that we did in the workshop, then you should know that I, well, not you should know, but there was a moment where I said something to the likes of um, constructing something in origami is like having something in your inventory during a video game. You find an, a tool, an item, um, yeah, something like that, and you can, you can sort of compound on it, you can use it later. And so I think the same applies here. You know, we construct the heptagon, and now that works as a basis, which we can then use to construct more heptagons, etc. Right? So one thing does lead to the next. And so I have all my folds of the heptagon here, and now what I'm going to do is fold them the other way. I'm really hard with the nail there, just to reapply the fold. By the way, intention counts. So I'm thinking about that point that we saw that the line seemed to hit, but it doesn't. So the thing is, if you use that point as a reference, even though you're very close, the fact that you intended to use that point and not the construction will lead to problems. More problems, that I think, than if you just um, constructed it instead of use that point as a reference. So here I'm getting up close and ripping off the paper at the crease lines that I marked. No blade necessary. Technically, I, I, sh I, I could have not used the knife on the other one. I know I said we we're gonna do a, a circumventing. So let me just get on that. Wait, what time is it? Oh, 30 minutes. No, I can't go over the 30 minute mark. So I'm gonna do another video for that one. I'll upload it later, but it's it's a Japanese way, uh, the Japanese math teacher taught, uh, teaches that one. I can do it in a minute, probably. Let me just overlap this and just be sure that they are actually congruent. And so the points seem to match. Yeah, well, some of them. I, I guess some points are a little bit off from looking at it. It's not perfect, perfect, but I think it's it's good enough. I can dig it. It could it could have been done better if I used a, more, a thinner marker because the point is just so thick it's easy to miss. But if I used like a fine point pen, then it would have been a lot better. Or I could have just actually traced the edges instead of just the vertices, or at least part of the edges. It doesn't matter if I, you know, if I don't mark where this sticky tape was getting in the way, as long as I could have marked the cross, I think that would have worked better. I think so. Um, yeah, we'll see. So, okay, really fast, really, really, really super duper fast. All right, here's how you would get a heptagon from, yeah, just any old thing. All right, here's uh, some random piece of paper. I'm going to extract a rectangle from this taking into account that we do have four perpendicular lines at the ready. I don't know, three, but it doesn't matter. So I have this little strip, and I'm going to cut a, a square out of it. I'm going to go super fast, you guys. This is going to be like a speed run of, of folding this thing. And what I'm going to do now is inscribe eight-fold symmetry onto this square. I'm going to take that away. I'm going to put a heptagon right there so it takes up the screen so we know where we're going, just, just this decoration. So I'm going to fold over here. So I'm going to fold this in half like that, and then I'm going to fold uh, my preliminary folds in a way, but keeping them all in the same state. So the, these two diagonal lines, those two are valleys, and so it are the, horizontal, the, the verticals, the vertical and the horizontal. I say it in plural because you can always just rotate your paper, and now what was horizontal is vertical, and vice versa. 
And now what we want is to find the line between these. So what I like to do here is hold in such a way that these two lines fall on themselves and these two will also fall on themselves because we're going through the center. Like that one will match to there, that other one will match to there. Yeah, now it's all good. All right, line goes through the center. This line falls on itself, so it's that one. Well, it doesn't, it's not itself actually, it's another line. Um, we can apply the hinge maneuver to this, doesn't really matter. Point is we want eightfold division. Uh, you can find, you know, several origami tutorials on how to fold an eightfold division. This is clearly not the best, but for some reason or other, this is the way that I prefer to do it. I think it's because it's just natural to me, and I, and I like to, to favor naturality over, over making things by force, I suppose. Okay, we have the eightfold division. Now what I'm going to do is fold this, collapse it, where these are mountains. What that means is, look, if I turn the paper over and have these as mountains, I mean, there's still mountains on the, you know, it's still the same, but like one way that it collapses looks like a dart, right? And if I collapse it the other way, it looks like a kite. So I want you to go into the kite form. This is the one we want, the kite form. And the idea is to fold these little bits that are hanging out there. So we got to fold them back like this. And then we kind of open this up. Somebody told me that this is called the little miracle. The idea is to open up the ones that also have these little flappy flaps there. So we fold all of them back and here's the trick for you. We're going to open this up. And the idea is that one of them is going to get the treatment of being folded up like this. And then that little flap is going to get folded onto the back like that. And that's going to, you know, it's going to get tucked. It's going to get tucked and folded up like that. Again, this could benefit from, from getting all the, uh, all the folds getting inverted. I think that works really well. And you know, if it helps you, you can turn this back. So what, what have we done here? We've taken an octagon and folded a slice away. The price is flatness. Now we've lost flatness, but we have gained seven edges equally apart from each other because these were part of a regular polygon, namely the octagon. So I can hold this point down. I can have another piece of paper here. Hold this point and this pyramid over my piece of paper. And you can see where the problems arise, well namely, the first problem is that there is a little bit of space that's being, that's being given by the fold, right? This, the fold is separating two, one of these vertices away from it. So this is not perfect is what I'm trying to get at. So I can just put my pen on the points there of this pyramid. I guess in a way I can just trace it also. So on the surface we had a, um, a heptagon. Now whether this is a regular heptagon, I don't think so. But you know it's a very close approximation. So you know now we have two ways of constructing a heptagon. We use this approximation that a Japanese math teacher told us how to do in an origami book at once downloaded off the internet, or we could do Tom Hall's method. I forget the name of this book by the way, which is a damn shame because it's a very good book. It has all these creative ideas on different polygons and rectangles and it's very beautiful. I like it. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little lesson. I'll see you guys next time and uh, yeah, take care, enjoy. This is a public video, so you know, make the most of it. Laters.